Today, I'm going to go over the process of negative feedback as it is used to maintain homeostasis in various systems in the body, mostly the endocrine system. So let's talk about negative feedback in general first. The concept of negative feedback is that we want to keep things in a particular balance. So we have a particular variable, and let's say that it is at this point in the body. And something happens that causes it to go down a little bit. What I want to do is I want to be able to raise it back up. So negative feedback will bring that back up. If it goes up a little bit, negative feedback will bring it back down again. One of the easiest ways to think of this is temperature. You don't want to be too warm or too cold. So if you are too warm, your body will cool you down by using sweat. And if you're too cold, it will warm you up by moving your muscles around with shivering. A specific process that is used to understand negative feedback is a negative feedback loop in which we put the different pieces together to see how they work. The starting point of every negative feedback loop is what we call a controlled variable. That's the item that we're actually trying to manage using negative feedback. To understand negative feedback, the next thing that we have to do is we have to be able to tell where that controlled variable is. So it needs to be sensed in some way, typically by the nervous system. And we call the next step a sensor or a receptor of the nervous system to tell us where we are. The next step after that is that something in the body needs to be able to tell what to do with that information. So I can sense a variable, but how do I know what to do with it? That comes from the control center. The control center, in this case, will tell the body what to do. Many times your control center is part of your brain, but not always. There are some body functions that work even if the brain isn't exactly doing uh, the job. Finally, we need to actually make something happen. And so the final step in the negative feedback loop is to effect a change, and it is called the effector. The effector is actually typically a specific body part, function, or activity that will then cause a change the, to the controlled variable and hopefully bring it back to the way you want it. So let's think about this in terms of temperature as a possible example. So if I'm going to use temperature as an example, temperature, the first thing I need to know is where's the receptor for temperature? Well, the receptor for temperature typically is found in the skin and it is often called a thermoreceptor because it does indeed sense temperature. So a thermoreceptor in skin would be the sensor that I'd be looking for. Next, it sends that information to the control center. In the case of temperature, the control center is in the brain and it is typically in a part of the brain called the hypothalamus. So that's kind of cool. That's the part of your brain that knows whether it's hot or cold. And then we move to the effector. Now, in this case, we actually have multiple effectors because there's different things that happen whether the temperature is low or high. So if the temperature is high, that means you are too warm, the effector is going to be to activate your sweat glands, release sweat onto the skin, and that will cool you down. However, if the temperature is low, we're going to have a slightly different system. So in the case of a low temperature, now we're going to activate muscles. Some of those muscles are below the skin and they shiver. So muscles to shiver. And then some of those muscles also create goosebumps and pull the hairs 
up on your arms and other places. So I'll say muscles to shiver and make goosebumps. And that's the effector for if you are cold. Both of those things will help to bring your temperature back to normal. Now I'm going to give you a slightly different example in a different part of your body, but one that is just as important. I'm going to give you an example of blood sugar. So in the example of blood sugar, that's the variable we're trying to control. You always want some amount of sugar in your blood. You need it for energy. Too low makes your body very concerned and too high is bad for you because anything that's high is toxic. Now, this isn't about blood sugar dropping way out of range. This is about dropping just a little bit out of range and your body making an adjustment before a problem occurs. Part of the problem with blood sugar is that our negative feedback loops get out of whack because we move the variables too fast and the body can't respond. But here's what it's supposed to do so that you never notice that your blood sugar changes. So the sensor or the receptor for blood sugar is found in your pancreas, and it's actually a very interesting structure. It's called the Islets of Langerhans. You can tell that was named after most likely the person who discovered them because it has a funny sounding name and has a capital letter. And these are little areas of the pancreas that when there is high blood sugar will release a substance to tell other areas of the pancreas to release other hormones and chemicals that cause things to happen. So as you might have noted from that description, in this case, all of this occurs in the pancreas and the pancreas actually acts as the control center. So your blood sugar is not controlled by your brain directly unless it gets way out of whack. Your pancreas does most of the work. Next up within the pancreas would be the high and low. So let's start with high blood sugar because usually what that means is you just ate. If you just ate, then what you want to do is you want to slightly lower your blood sugar by taking it out of the blood and putting it into your cells. You have these great little cells in your pancreas. They are called beta cells. And they release a substance called insulin. You might be familiar with insulin. It is the substance that is needed to take blood sugar out of your bloodstream and put it into your cells. Once that's released, the insulin goes into the body, it does its job, and the sugar levels come back to normal, and you store that sugar to use for energy. Now, what if you haven't eaten in a while? If you haven't eaten in a while, your blood sugar might be a little bit low. If it's a little bit low, you actually have alpha cells, and they release a chemical called glucagon. Glucagon is an interesting hormone because what it does is it tells the liver to release a little bit of sugar. It's in your liver in the form of glycogen, which is just a big long string of sugars. And the glucagon says, hey liver, we, we need a little bit of sugar right now. And it will release just a little bit, just enough to get you back to where you need. And that's how basic negative feedback works. Your controlled variables, what you're trying to control, your sensor or your receptor picks up the information. It sends it to the control center, which makes the decisions about what will happen. And then the effectors are the parts of the body that make a change. Every time you encounter a negative feedback situation, you should always look at a negative feedback loop to determine what should be happening and if that item is being controlled properly. Now, I do want to shift gears for just a second here and talk about a completely different process, but one that's kind of similar enough that it sometimes gets people confused, and that's positive feedback. So positive feedback is not the same as negative feedback. In this case, instead of trying to balance something, we are using a function of the body that is going to change and keep changing until an effect happens and then it's going to suddenly shift back. So typically the way you would visualize this concept is that you have something at a certain level and then something causes it to increase 
and increase and increase and increase until eventually some kind of function or thing happens that causes that to go back to its starting point. So you can see we are climbing a hill and then dropping off again, which is very different from negative feedback. So there's a number of functions in the body that cover positive feedback. One of those is blood clotting. So blood clotting, for instance, occurs when you have a blood vessel, and what happens is it accidentally gets a hole because you cut it in some way. So what do we need to do to fill that hole? Well, we need platelets, which are little proteins in the blood. And when the platelets see the edge of the hole, they'll grab hold of it. And in fact, more of them will grab hold and more of them will grab hold. So long as they see that there is an open space, which is marked by certain kinds of chemicals that are released when cells are damaged, they'll pick up and pick up and pick up. And eventually there'll be a lot of them filling that hole. However, you do want them to stop eventually because if they kept filling the hole, they would clot the entire blood vessel and then you'd have a problem. So once all the damaged cells are covered and those chemicals are no longer present, the clotting stops and the platelets keep moving in the bloodstream instead of filling up the hole. Another good example of positive feedback is labor to push out a baby. Because as the baby pushes against the pelvis, the body forces the muscles of the uterus to push and the baby comes further out, which causes the muscles to push harder and so on and so on. And soon the baby pops out. Now there's no pressure on the edge of the pelvis so the body no longer feels the need to push. And that's positive feedback.